All right, everyone, we want to welcome you to the Maryland 6 U.S. Congress debate. Um, we're going to start off tonight with this Pledge of Allegiance, so if you would mind, please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Good evening and welcome to the Republican candidates for Maryland's 6th District, friends and neighbors in the audience, and those tuning in. Tonight's event is hosted by Voices for Washington County. We are conservatives working at the grassroots level to encourage participation in the political process through training and recruiting precinct leaders, supporting elected officials, and encouraging new candidates for office. Most of you probably recognize me from the last time I performed on this stage as sailor number three in Anything Goes. <laughs> but I do not plan on tap dancing tonight. I am Beth Harvey and very excited to moderate this evening's discussion. The candidates drew their order for opening and closing remarks backstage and will each have two minutes for an introduction and to answer each question. A chime will signify the time at two minutes and then at 10 seconds. We have a lot of great questions tonight submitted by our membership and others. So let's begin with introductions by Matthew Foldy. What do David Trone and Joe Biden have in common? What? Both of them are multimillionaires from Pennsylvania, and both of them use their elected office to make even more money than they ever had before. And neither of them can find Western Maryland on the map to save their lives. We have a unique opportunity to finally beat David Trone this November, and it's an opportunity that we can't afford to miss. But it's going to require a Republican candidate who knows how to do that. My name is Matthew Foldy. I'm an investigative reporter. I'm a conservative activist and I've been exposing democratic corruption at the highest levels. I'm running for Congress to do the same to our part-time Congressman, David Trone. Couple questions. Who here knows that David Trone is currently being sued by a 66-year-old woman for age-based discrimination right here in Maryland? If you know this, it's probably because I told you. Who here knows that David Trone refuses to give Jewish employees paid time off on our high holy days? Meanwhile, we've been giving him paid time off for the past two and a half years. Who here knows that David Trone skipped more than 25% of the votes in DC last year, even though he literally lives in Potomac, 20 miles away? Who here knows that all of David Trone's constituent offices that we pay for have been closed and locked for the past two and a half years? Who here knows that David Trone hosted President Biden for a mask-free fundraiser at his Potomac mansion just last week while he continues to not do any constituent services? As Republican candidates, we must expose the Democrats because we simply know the media obviously will never do that. Now, let's talk about this election. Raise your hand if you're tired of these multimillionaire Democrats from Potomac buying our seat in Congress and then disappearing. Okay, now keep your hand raised if you want a new generation of leadership to finally beat David Trone and send Nancy Pelosi packing for retirement. <laughs> My name is Matthew Foldy and I'm running for Congress for three reasons. First, who better than an investigative reporter to expose the most corrupt administration of my lifetime? The mainstream media sure as hell won't. You might have read my work in the Washington Free Beacon, listened to me talk about it on Mark Levin's radio show, or seen me discuss it on with Maria Bartiromo and Tucker Carlson on Fox News. I've already exposed massive corruption in our nation's energy department and Chinese influence in our commerce department. I've been on this beat from the beginning, appearing on Newsmax every Friday to help expose the truth. There's a lot more oversight that we need to do, and I'm gonna start by issu issuing subpoenas on day one in Washington. Second, America needs a new generation of leadership, but Joe Biden and the Democrats in Congress are asleep at the wheel. Their failed radical policies are destroying our country, and I'm running for Congress to stop socialism today to protect our tomorrow. And third, representing you and your concerns is a full-time job, but David Trone treats it like a hobby. I resigned from my job as an investigative reporter to run for Congress because I'm committed to this fight. David Trone, on the other hand, runs his business full-time and treats us as an afterthought. In fact, all of his congressional offices have been closed for the past two years. I'm gonna hold David Trone accountable for selling us out to Nancy Pelosi. My name is Matthew Foldy. I'm a conservative investigative reporter. I'm running for Congress to save our future, expose and investigate this corrupt administration, and make representing you my full-time job. Thanks so much for having me. I'd be honored to have your votes. Thank you, Matthew. The next candidate, Bob Poisonier. I, Robert Bryan Poisonier, do solemnly swear or affirm that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, 
foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I'm about to enter. So help me God. I took this oath on January 9th, 1995. Today, it still rings true to me. I took this oath of my own free will, and I meant every word of it. My first day with the Federal Bureau of Prisons, a component under the United States Department of Justice, we were told it was our integrity that got us there. Today, our government has no integrity. We must restore the faith of the people and our leaders. In order to do so, we must continue what President Trump started and drain the swamp. I intend on going after every corrupt politician who uses their office to further their criminal enterprise. They must be held accountable, accountable to you, the people. Politicians work for you, not some big tech company who gives politicians kickbacks for passing laws that destroy America and benefit them. That is bribery and nothing less. It's a violation of federal law and it must be stopped. As an American citizen, you have the right to have your vote count. Unfortunately, this is no longer the case in America. We have seen in the 2020 presidential election, your vote does not count. Our politicians use foreign entities and big tech companies to alter the elections, results to fit their own needs and agendas. Democrats are fighting hard to destroy our election process and have been doing so for many years. We the people ask for evidence of the election interference and we've been given that. If you haven't heard of or seen 2000 Mules, I encourage you to do so. It gives evidence of what really happened during the 2020 presidential election and who really won. And I can tell you it wasn't Joe Biden. It proves foreign entities such as the United Nations, the DNC, and other foreign governments were involved in rig rigging our election. We need an election process. We need an election process that cannot be tampered with. Your vote must count. I will do everything in my power to ensure our election process cannot be tampered with and that every vote cast is counted. You, as American citizen, have a right to bear arms. In our Constitution, there are no limits on how many weapons or ammunition you can purchase. There are no limits on the capacity of a magazine or how many rounds your weapon can carry. There are no stipulations in the Constitution to register your firearm or apply for a concealed weapons permit. It is your right, should you decide to bear arms, if you're a law-abiding citizen, your rights are protected. The Constitution is unrestricted. I will do everything in my power to protect your rights, and I will fight against red flag laws. In our nation, we have two great forces that protect our country. The United States military and our fearless law enforcement. Thank you, Bob. Now welcome Colt Black. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Colt Black. I'm a happily married father of three, small business owner, licensed funeral director and mortician. At the end of the day, I think anyone sitting in this room and anyone listening at home wants the absolute very best for their family. At the end of the day, family is the bedrock of our society. And no matter whether you're sitting at your kitchen table, on your recliner, or on your favorite couch, the conversations around policy and politics starts at home. And providing for your family is becoming harder and harder in today's world. Whether we're talking about the rising cost of inflation at the grocery store, the rising cost of energy, or crime in the streets where we can't feel safe in our cities, towns, and even out in the rural communities surrounding Washington County. Additionally, our constitutional rights are being continually violated, whether you're speaking of the Second Amendment, the Fourth, the First, so on and so forth. At the end of the day, 
Energy is indeed the lifeblood of our economy, and we need to work to bring down the cost of energy by unleashing the free market, whether we're talking about coal, natural gas, nuclear, wind, solar. We need to ensure that all of these energy sources are being used to drive down consumer cost. To address the absolute astounding rise in inflation and bring down the cost for business to be able to produce the goods and services that we need. Ensuring that our police officers are ready, fully funded, and are abiding by the Constitution to protect our communities. As well as ensuring that government involvement in education is constitutional and we remove federal control in education and bring it back to the local level with our school boards in the counties, municipalities, townships, and towns throughout the United States. Thank you. Thank you, Colt. Next, we welcome Dr. Mariella Roca. Yeah. Thank you. Good evening. I'm absolutely thrilled and excited to be here with all of you. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy evening to be here. My name is Mariella Roca, and I was born and raised in Puerto Rico under pretty challenging circumstances. I, I had a hard life. I grew up poor. Me and my mom and my brother lived in a sing, single room basement, and my brother and I slept in a bunk bed in the hallway. My mom worked as a housekeeper, and my father never provided for us. My mom worked so hard, and, she, and she, even though we didn't have much, she instilled in us a sense of strong work ethic, a fighting spirit, and a love for our country. I always felt a strong pull toward serving my country, and I joined the United States Air Force at the age of 20. I raised my right hand, and I sw swore to support and defend the Constitution of the United States, this document right here. And I did that. I did two deployment tours, one of them being in Bagram, Afghanistan in 2007. While there, I served at the Bagram Detainee Prison, where I looked at the Taliban every single day. I looked at the worst of the worst. And this is why I, I'm running for Congress. I'm running for Congress to support the Constitution. This is under attack by woke, left, radical Democrats, and we have to fight back. This is the year. There is too much at risk for us to get this wrong. There's a lot of great candidates here, and you're going to learn a lot more about us, but we've, we've got to get this right. So after my mom passed away, I settled right here in Hagerstown. I had my son about a mile away right here in Meredith, Meredith Medical Center, and I bought my first home here. I put myself through school and got an MBA and doctorate in business administration while always working a full-time job and raising my two amazing kids. Now I live in Frederick and work in medical logistics as a federal contractor for the VA. When people ask me why I run, want to run for office, it's because of my two amazing kids. They are in a system where schools are trying to crush the American dream and rewrite history. And it's time that, as parents, we fight back for our kids. And look, I am just someone who wants to make our country a better place for our kids by taking the fight to woke liberal Democrats in D.C., and I think enough is enough. I will bring America First, an America First agenda to Marylanders throughout the 6th Congressional District. I'm an Afro-Latina, I'm fluent in Spanish, and I'm a mom and a combat veteran. I am David Trone and the Democrats' worst nightmare. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Mariella. And um, now welcome Neil Parrott. Good evening. It's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be on the stage with other people who are contesting the District 6 Congressional District. The bottom line is, we must beat David Trohn this coming November. We have to. I serve in the General Assembly. I've been there for 12 years. In December, they passed a map that was worse than the map they passed 10 years ago under Governor O'Malley. I actually didn't think there was any way they could make the map worse. We sued over the map, it went to the U.S. Supreme Court. We got a referendum on the map. I led mdpetitions.com. Many of you signed the petitions. We got it on the ballot. Unfortunately, the question wasn't fair. They threw it out. So right when they passed it, somehow they made it worse. They made it so that Andy Harris on the Eastern Shore, our only Republican in Congress, would have a really tough time winning that election because President Biden won in that district that they just drew. 
And then in District 6, where we're running right now today, it improved a little bit. It went from a D plus 8 to a D plus 6. We sued, I sued, with Judicial Watch. We won that lawsuit. As a result, right now, if you look at racetothewhitehouse.com, it shows Neil Parrott versus David Trone, and I'm up by 3.6 percentage points. The map was changed. Here's a picture of the new map. I tell you what, I'm really excited because we're going to win. We're going to get David Trone out of office, and he's going to be gone for 10 years. And we're going to get Nancy Pelosi. This is going to be one of the five seats we need to flip from Democrat to Republican to get rid of Nancy Pelosi once and for all as Speaker of the House. In this new map, you see that all of Frederick County is united. Now, we finally have Western Maryland united, and we need to have a Western Maryland representative going down to D.C. And I live right here in Hagerstown. I will represent Western Maryland for you in D.C. come this January. Thank you, Neil. And finally, Jonathan Jenkins. All right, thank you very much. My name is Jonathan Jenkins. I am a Marine, an Iraq war vet. I have two small businesses. One became a lot smaller because of COVID-1984, a tech business, and also because of what's been happening in the White House, the open um, borders and crime increasing. I started a firearms business, trying to lead by example. I am running because this is not the America I grew up in. Very simple. You know, I love my America that I grew up in. I'm looking at my children now, eight and 10. This is not it. This is not about the wokeness. This is about, you know, fake history. We cannot have this. So I decided to throw my hat in because I didn't care what the map looked like. I was just going to run, and in Marine Corps fashion, I was going to go and get it. I've been doing this for 16 months now, nonstop. I am the grassroots campaigner. Nobody runs harder than me. You see what happens on social media. I'm out there almost every single day, even Sundays now. We have to win this back. We will win this back. We will support whoever the candidate's getting through here, but we need the right candidate. We need the one with the wisdom. I have been blessed with the right wisdom at the right time. I've worked in almost half of the federal agencies, including the ones we care deeply about, about going after, CMS, HHS, NIH, DOD, you know, commerce. I've, I've been there. I've done that. I know how to handle external threats. The external threats are going at us with cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, machine learning. That's my background. So if you want the candidate that's going to hustle every day, has the wisdom, okay, has the tenacity to not stop, that is me, okay? My kids are the most precious thing here, and so we come to four pillars. It's safe. Security, Americanism, family, and faith. Security is going to cover a lot, right? Border security, cyber security, election security, right? We've got to stop these ballots in here. We, we need to secure that. Americanism, we must support American ideals and history. Family first, and then faith. We never should shut down churches, never should shut down synagogues. They all must remain open. Thank you very much. Thank you for your introductions. Let's begin with foreign policy and defense. Matthew. We'll begin with the first question. Israel has been a longtime friend and ally of the United States, yet the Democrat Party supports the defund Israel movement and increasingly opposes additional military assistance. Will you support Israel? This is deeply personal to me as a Jewish American and as an American with common sense. And uh, I have literally been assaulted by radical Islamic activists at the White House. As a new 18-year-old, I went to counter-protest a group of jihadist supporters, 20,000 strong. I hadn't realized they had cleared out all of the counter-protesters who support Israel. And uh, I get to the White House, all of a sudden I feel a tightening around my neck as uh, a jihadist activist rips the Israeli flag from my throat and sets it on fire. And what does the Obama administration do? And as I'm literally being assaulted in front of the White House, Absolutely nothing. What does the Biden administration do when foreign-born jihadists take a synagogue hostage in Texas? Absolutely nothing. For the Biden administration, parents concerned about school boards are a greater concern, they view them as domestic terrorists, than jihadists who would eradicate me and every other Jew in America. So it goes without question that I would support Israel. This is deeply personal. The Biden administration right now, the only foreign policy goal it has is giving Iran a nuclear weapon, come hell or high water. And my family, I have family in Israel. 
they will be wiped off the face of the earth. The Ayatollahs have made it clear they're going to develop a nuclear weapon with the Democrats, with the Democrats' assistance, and they will eliminate my family. This is a genocidal Islamic regime that the Biden administration is working hand in hand with. It's absolutely disgraceful. So of course I'll support Israel, but it's important to also support our other allies overseas who the Biden administration has also completely abandoned. We are a joke in the world under the Biden administration. We saw them surrender Afghanistan. We saw them bow down to the communist Chinese party. My reporting as an investigative journalist actually exposed that China is leveraging the Commerce Secretary's husband and the Commerce Secretary perhaps in return is giving lifelines to Chinese telecommunications giants like Huawei to spy on American citizens. The Biden administration caved to China in going to the Olympics where our Olympians were spied on, where they were blackmailed. The Biden administration also gave $1.6 billion, my reporting showed, to the, from the military to China. My reporting has led to multiple congressional investigations on China and other things, and I'm ready to continue that on day one. But yes, of course, I will support Israel. Bob, what is the most critical issue, in your view, facing American national security today? I think one of our biggest problems is that we get ourselves involved in whatever is happening out there. We're, we're in the process right now of giving billions and billions of dollars to Ukraine, and yet our own military here, our own borders, are, are suffering. Uh, the Biden administration during the withdrawal or surrender of Afghanistan brought all these terrorists in. We now know there are terrorists walking our streets that weren't vetted before they came in. I think we need to spend a little bit more time and a little bit more money funding our own military, keeping our borders safe, and rounding up these, these illegal aliens that are here that are, that are bringing their ideologies that we just don't want in our country. I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> Colt, an open border almost makes every state a border state. What is your opinion on the crisis at our southern border? Well, thank you. So, you know, we are seeing illegal immigration at record numbers right now. And of course, the Biden administration and his radical, rabid liberal ilk are doing absolutely nothing uh, to stop the illegal immigration. I find it absolutely heart-wrenching to think of the folks that's trying to make this trek and are winding up dead and, and you know, raped and, and things of this nature along the way. Um, we need to be sending a clear message to ensure that, number one, they're not coming. And number two, we need to rally our local law enforcement to be able to enforce the federal immigration laws. And if they do not have the wherewithal to do so, we need to pull federal funding from these states and communities where uh, they're not willing to enforce the federal law. Because if it was a gun law or a drug law, the local police departments would want to enforce that. They would go out of their way to enforce it. But yet we have sheriffs and state police and local police that are not enforcing immigration. So we need to work tirelessly to secure the border. We have had the Safe Fences Act since the early 90s. The reality of it is, is it has not been enforced. So we have the legislation in place. We need to build the wall. We need to ensure that our police and border patrol are fully funded to deal with this immigration crisis. And we need to quickly and expeditiously deport those who are here illegally. Mariella, the group of seven leading economies warned on Saturday that the war in Ukraine is stoking a global food and energy crisis. Do you agree, and what, in your opinion, needs to be done? So thank you. Um, so like it's already been mentioned, I really do think that what needs to be clear is that Biden's foreign policy operation from day one has not been all smooth sailing. First thing we need to do in regards to foreign policy is get rid of Joe Biden. He's got to go, and we've got to get rid of the woke liberals in Congress that are voting lockstep with Joe Biden. Um, many of his aspects, many things that he's been doing are worrisome. One, with the Afga botched Afghan withdrawal, me being a veteran that was there, I can't tell you how horrendously humiliated I am on the disastrous withdrawal that they did in Afghanistan. They are just projecting bad diplomacy. Um, they're projecting weakness, like we mentioned earlier, and we just look weak and stupid 
in the world stage. So in regards to Ukraine, you know, I'm a vet, I've been to war. Um, I really do feel that there's too many chicken hawks in DC that want to escalate an unnecessary war with Russia without a concrete plan. I've been to war and I know the ramifications of, it, of, of bad diplomacy and bad war. Um, I, Ukraine is affecting us all and I, I think the thing that we really have to highlight is the hypocrisy of the Democrats. I do agree that we have to give them humanitarian, humanitarian aid like we do to many other countries, but how is it that we could find $53 billion overnight to give to, the, to Ukraine but we couldn't give President Trump $4 billion to build the wall, which, oh, by the way, would have saved lives here in America. So I do think that we really need to find a way to end this peacefully. And like I said, terrible diplomacy comes with cost. So we've got to get better leaders. We've got to get Joe Biden out. We've got to get David Trone out and all the woke liberals with them. Thank you. Neil. Congress gave Communist China permanent most favored nation trading status 20 years ago. Then Senator Joe Biden said in a congressional hearing at the time, getting China into the World Trade Organization, a rules-based organization, will subject China to multilateral pressures on trade and over time enhance their respect for the rule of law or they will not be in. The opposite of what the president predicted has come to pass. Since China has not traded fairly and the World Trade Organization has been its accomplice, what would you look to do in legislation to keep our financial elite from investing more financial capital and sending more American jobs to China? So when I was in high school, I had a special project that I was assigned North-South Technology Transfer contingent on political or social change. I had no idea what it meant. But it was a big deal at the U.S. Naval Academy that I was able to go there and make a presentation. We actually went to the uh, U.S. Congress, did research. Bottom line is, that's right, it was President Nixon who made China the most favored nation status. And their hope was, well, they're going to learn capitalism works, so they're going to do our way of things to become a democracy. That didn't happen. They're communist. They became hardcore communist. They transferred some of the things that are good about democracy about capitalism, they tried to make it part of their own system, but they're still communists, they still own everything, and we need to have better trade deals. And thankfully, President Trump took a hard stance against China, and that needs to continue right now. Our biggest enemy in the world right now, the biggest threat, is China. Right now, they're looking at Taiwan. Do they go take it over, or do they not? And they're looking at how the United States responds. They're looking at how Europe responds. And they're going to see, should we do this or not? You know, we need to make it so that they know, don't do it. Because if you do, there are going to be some serious ramifications, not just economic, but other ramifications as well. You know, the cyber warfare that's occurring is hurting our businesses here in the United States. We need to use our full military to go against cyber warfare to stop it. We saw prices jump in oil. It was over about a year ago all about cyber warfare. We can't allow that to continue. That's a threat that China and Russia have on the United States right now that we're not defending against at all. We are completely vulnerable, but it's time to get our military involved and to fight back. We need to make sure that we don't treat China like they're our friends because they are not. They're our biggest enemy in the world right now, and we need to make sure we treat them that way. We need to make sure that we have tough, again, trade deals. And it wouldn't hurt if we don't trade much with China at all. We can do most of that right here. I know prices will go up a little bit, but a little bit of price increase is much better for world safety than what we're doing right now. Thank you. Jonathan, the United States is dependent upon China for most of its critical pharmaceuticals and many other medical items. Do you believe this is a national security issue and what could be done? Uh, really, really good comment there. So. <clears throat> We, if you are a true America first, it's not because you're a Trumper, it's just because it makes sense. We need to be able to sustain everything here ourselves. We need to be able to have all of our core, core services, not just pharmaceuticals, but baby formula, everything in here. We have seen in the past that China has actually killed people. They had toothpaste years ago, it was killing kids in Haiti. So we have to, as much as possible, be able to sustain ourselves. Originally, when we uh, 
got to the 19th century, we tried to fight two wars. We set up a lot of our infrastructure to fight a war on the West Coast and the East Coast, and we tried to have all the industries we needed to support ourselves in case these things happen. Being over-dependent upon China is a very dangerous thing. Um, we found out some of those COVID tests, right? They had metals in there. Why would you put metal in there? Can't figure that out, right? Killing kids, I said, with the toothpaste. Cybersecurity issues, just because you get some type of um, pharmaceutical equipment. Imagine getting equipment where they know everything that's in there and can monitor it and literally can shut people down. It is a very dangerous country right now. Um, however, we, we need to build within, but we also can't just automatically just alienate China right away. Because if you go at them that they are our enemy like that, that's, that may be too hard and they could shut us down completely. Most of our aspirin is not even here anymore, right? I think China makes all that stuff. So we gotta get back on track, but we can't just shut off China. What we need to do is encourage people to want to invest and create in this country. If you want to invest in China, I don't have a problem with that. However, what I want to have is, let's make it such a great incentive to keep your money here, invest here, use the people here, that it makes the most business sense. True Republicans, you want to have the ability to choose anywhere you want to do business in the world. So pharmaceuticals, again, wrapping it up, you, we got to be self-sustained here completely. I don't trust them. Thank you. Let's segue into a discussion on health care. Matthew, please start us off. Health care has deteriorated over the past decade, and according to a Johns Hopkins study, medical malpractice now ranks as a leading cause of death. Most Americans agree that the health care system is in need of an overhaul, but there's a major disagreement about how best to do it. What do you think should be done about reforming or abandoning the Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as Obamacare? One thing that will be very clear tonight is that any person on this stage is going to be a hell of a lot better congressman than David Trone. I mean, there's, there's no doubt about this. And, and I think it's incumbent on all of us here in the audience to you know, support whoever wins the nomination. And real quickly on China, though, this is exactly why it's important to send an investigative reporter to Congress. My reporting on Chinese infiltration of the Commerce Department, the U.S. military sending billions of dollars for fake COVID test, kit, test kits to China has led to multiple congressional investigations of the Biden administration. There's a lot more investigating that needs to be done. Now, when it comes to health care, Democrats have destroyed our health care system just like they've destroyed everything else. I mean, these are the people who have candles of Anthony Fauci that are all made in China and think that this makes them a virtuous person. So Democrats are raising health care costs just like they're raising the cost of everything. In America. So, of course, we obviously need to jettison the disastrous Obamacare that every Democrat in, in Congress has prioritized since 2010. But it's important for Republicans to obviously offer an alternative. So, once we get to Congress, once we finally fire Pelosi, fire Trone, and then get a Republican in the White House, that needs to be a top priority because health care costs and the rising health care costs are a massive concern to Americans. So, we need to do things in the meantime, like making it easier to have basic necessities like baby formula. All of a sudden, Democrats realized there's no baby formula in the United States of America. Well, now they're going to do phony investigations because they've been called out for their absenteeism, which is one of the things that I'm doing this entire week during the campaign. Every single day of this week, I'm going to a different office of David Trones here in the district, hearkening back to my work as a reporter last month on how no Democrat in this country actually wants to work for the people. I was at his office in Frederick County today that's closed. I'm going to be at his office in Allegheny County tomorrow that is closed, his office in Mon Montgomery County that is closed on Wednesday, and his office here in Hagerstown that's closed. I went to his office in Hagerstown today. It claims it's open two days a week, one of those days being a Monday. I went today, and it's closed because his staff is attending events in the district. Has anyone here ever seen David Trone ever? That's what I figured. We need a representative who actually shows up. Colt, Colt Black, Republicans in Congress failed to repeal and replace Obamacare when they controlled both the House and the Senate. Do you support doing so, and if so, why? Thank you. So the reality of it is, is the Affordable Care Act, when it went to the Supreme Court, is it a tax, is it not a tax? You know, the whole back and forth situation with that. But the reality of it is, Health care comes down to the 10th Amendment, and it is a state's rights issue. There should not be a federal law that impacts the health care in the state of Maryland versus the state of Pennsylvania, or so on and so forth, because the reality of it is, every state is radically different. 
what your health care needs are here in Maryland is very different than what your health care needs might be in, say, Alaska. So we need custom-tailored health care solutions. So I support a 100% clean repeal of Obamacare, a one-paragraph bill reverting everything back to the states under the Tenth Amendment. Neil, since passage of the Affordable Care Act, health care prices and deductibles are higher and too costly for many on base programs. Would you support health care reform? And do you have ideas for a way to address the dissatisfaction with the current health care system? For me, this goes way back. My wife April and I, we started the Hagerstown Tea Party in the year 2009 because Dick Army was coming to speak to the Republican Club here, and I was wondering, well, who is Dick Army? What's he about? He was in charge of Freedom Works. We were taxed enough already. I think we all knew that, and we saw our freedoms being eroded. In the year 2009 and 2010, we took about eight trips, bus trips down to D.C. We organized those. Thirteen full buses went to D.C. We organized it for the 912 rally so that we could stand up for our freedoms, stand up against being taxed enough already, and stand up for our freedom to choose our own health care. You know, Joe Wilson, a congressman, he got in trouble because he said, you lie to President Obama at his uh, address to the nation. Unfortunately, Joe Wilson was completely right. He should have never apologized. Obama was lying. He said, you can choose your doctor. No, you couldn't choose your doctor. He said, crisis will come down as the Affordable Care Act. He was wrong. Prices skyrocketed. He said you'll have plenty of health care and you're going to see the doctor you're more plentiful than you have before. How many of you have seen a doctor in the last year? Don't they normally send you to a nurse practitioner? Mm -hmm. Our health care has diminished under Obamacare and it needs to be repealed immediately. One of the worst things that Senator McCain did when he was in the U.S. Senate, and it was disgraceful, he had promised to vote to overcome and to get rid of Obamacare, but at the last minute he changed his mind with Mitch O'Connell right next to him, he went like this. And because of him, we still have Obamacare. But because of you and us, we're going to take back the House. We're going to take back the U.S. Senate. We're going to take back the presidency. And we're going to get rid of Obamacare. Mariella. Health care is a major expense for businesses and government entities, such as Washington County, where health care is funded by tax dollars. We have transparency of cost of almost all things we buy, but not really for health care. Would you support giving people more choice, quality care, and transparency on cost? And if so, how could this be done? Absolutely, and I really do think that health care is one of those topics that is very important to me. When I was younger, like I mentioned, we grew up uh, very poor, and my mom um, really didn't have health insurance. She couldn't afford it for us. And then when my mom was terminally ill, I saw firsthand how broken the system is and how expensive her chemo medications were. Uh, I remember her first 30-day uh, supply for her, for her chemo treatment was about uh, $1,500 copay for us. So this is really important for me, and I really think that I'm one of the candidates here that really can speak to that. Um, I know that there's a lot of things, and I kind of want to shift back over to the Obamacare uh, thing, because I, I, I really had a couple things on my mind. Um, if you did or didn't know, I resigned my government position to run for office, and I decided to keep my VA insurance 100% through the VA. And thankfully, President Trump did a lot of things to trying to reform the VA for us veterans um, with uh, care in the community, but there's still a lot of work. Um, and I do think that there's really two paths moving forward for healthcare in my mind. Number one, the Medicare for all BS that the left is trying to push is basically VA health care for all. And if there's any veterans out there and you get your care through the VA, I am telling you, you we do not want that. Um, the, uh, it, you know, the, the, if this is how uh, government treats our nation's heroes with VA health care that is so severely broken, do we really think that they're going to do better for you? I don't think they really are. And the second path that I see forward, honestly, in the ideal scenario would be some kind of a patient doctor run health care that provides patients with uh, more choices and lower costs. So I, I, I do think that that's where we have to go towards. Thank you. Jonathan, 
What ideas do you bring to the table given the projection that Medicare is expected to be bankrupt by 2026? Should Congress reform the biggest social programs in the budget from Social Security to health care? Absolutely, it has to be done because if it goes broke, you have nothing. So we finally have to have the political will to get things done. The, the age is too low, the age has to increase, but I think we can do other things in the, in the process. For example, we need to eliminate federal taxes on retirees. We are, we are, we are living than longer before. Cost of goods keep going up, thanks to Joe, a lot more up. Right? And we also have the medical costs are going to go up. As we age, we are going to have more dementia. We are going to have more types of cancer. Allow people not to be wards of the government. So we need to eliminate all federal taxes on retirees. We need to have better means tests. We, we need to also start privatizing as much as possible. Everything the government touches, except for the Marine Corps, yeah, a little bit, um, doesn't do it, doesn't go well, right? And we got to admit that and privatize. If you look at elective surgeries, the cost continues to go down. How can that be, right? And the cost of government health care continues to climb. It is not ran like a business. We need to completely blow it up, privatize as much as possible. We need to open it across states, across borders. I don't care if you want to get health care from Iraq. If it works for you because they have some kind of dental plan over there, then go at it, Hoss, right? We need that. We need to be much more creative, but we got to get government out of the way. We need to have businesses come in, the right businesses, and just restructure the whole thing. Thank you. Bob, what do you support to improve the health care system? Would you support some government deregulation of the bureaucratic controls on health care and free market in initiatives? I think one of the biggest problems in health care is the fact that doctors are not allowed to be doctors. If they want to do a procedure, they call the insurance company. If the insurance company says, yeah, let's do it, then the doctor does it. If the insurance company says, no, I'm not gonna, we're not going to pay for that, so then the patient who needs something done can't get it done, can't get the medication they need. I think what has to happen is the insurance companies have to back off a little bit, let doctors be doctors, we pay good money for insurance. How can they tell, they don't know me, so how can they tell the doctor what I'm allowed to get, what I'm not allowed to get? I think what we have to do is, when a doctor says, we, I mean, we have to listen to the doctor. The doctor says, you need your leg amputated. The insurance company says, well, we're not gonna pay for that yet because he ain't completely uh, um, rotted out yet. Gangrene ain't completely set in. So we're just going to wait a little minute. And, you know, we just need to start listening to our doctors. I don't believe the government should be, like, I'll bring up Obamacare, okay? Basically what Obamacare was, in, in my opinion, was Obama's way of trying to get people dependent upon state systems, okay? And they just, the government needs to get out of our lives. You know, I, I got insurance. I'm retired, law enforcement. I got insurance. But yet, when I turn a certain age, I have to convert that to Medicare. Well, I don't want to turn my stuff to Medicare. The government has no right to tell me what insurance I can have and what insurance I can't have. We need to let the doctors be doctors. The government needs to stay out of our business. Thank you. Uh, let's segue our discussion into uh, economic issues. Neil, the first question will go to you. Agriculture is an important element of Western Maryland economy, yet we see that farmers' input costs are skyrocketing. Fuel, fertilizer, pesticides, they've all gone up dramatically this spring. What can we do to invest in and support our farming community, particularly during these tough times? Well, you know, I've served in the Maryland State House for 12 years. Every single year, and right now I'm on the uh, Environmental and Transportation Committee. Every single year, there are new environmental laws that go forward that make it very, very expensive and make it hard for farmers to do their job. They want to do their job, but they're tied. And it's, it's very difficult for them. We need to take some of those regulations and put them back a little bit. You know, it's funny, I get a 0% um, rating from this environmental group a lot of years. And I'll tell you why I get a 0% because it's 100% pro-farmer rating, and that's what you need to do when you send me down to Congress, is to make sure that our farmers are represented, to make sure that they're not harmed like they are right now. Now, the costs are going up, 
And they're going up because energy is going up, the cost is because we're not energy independent any longer. And that's because of President Biden. It goes right that back to his very first day of office. There were leases where we had on federal lands to be able to drill for oil or gas. He cut those leases. We had the Keystone XL pipeline that was going to go through the country. We'd get better oil, better natural gas. He cut that pipeline. It's gone right now. And at the same time, he allowed a pipeline to go from Ukraine to Germany, which actually helped start this Ukraine war. It was complete wrong decision making on behalf of the president because he thinks that we can have some kind of environmental change that we can make our country better than everybody else in the world and we can fix all the world's problem environmentally. We can't do it. The world's most polluter is China. And what's China doing for their environment? And I'll tell you what they're doing, nothing. And we're not asking them to do anything. We're saying, don't worry, we'll do everything. And in 30 years, you guys can start cleaning up your environment. Do you think that's ever gonna happen? It's not gonna happen. We need to make sure we're competitive. We need, we need to make sure our farmers are able to farm. We need to make sure that we're energy independent. And we need to stop these pipe dreams that we're gonna get our electricity from solar or from wind only. It's just not gonna happen. We need to be able to live in reality and we need to be able to be energy independent again. Yes. Colt, in our three branches of government, Congress is the power of the purse. If elected, how can you see that local government in our community receives extra help from federal dollars without growing the government? Well, thank you. So, I think one of the biggest ways that we can do this is to change our tax code. The reality of it is, if you look at our current tax code, how are taxes collected? Taxes are collected federally, and they wind up trickling down. We need to take back our tax code and have them go from local to federal. And the way to do that is through the Fair Tax Plan. What the Fair Tax Plan does is it repeals the 16th Amendment, it eliminates the IRS, and it eliminates all personal income taxes, business income taxes, as well as estate taxes. And what that does is it enables the states to collect the tax revenue on a national sales tax and send it to Washington. So as those needs need to be addressed, there can be provisions placed within the new tax code to see that that money stays local as it's collected. And there's also fees that are paid directly to the collecting states and municipalities by the new tax law that will uh, also help fund those municipalities. So I think creating a new method of funding via our tax code is probably one of the biggest ways to ensure our local communities are receiving tax dollars properly. Thank you. Bob, Congress has passed a trillion dollar infrastructure bill, yet we have not seen relief for the overcrowded and heavily used I-81 stretch through Maryland. This has an economic impact on our area. Do you think that with the likely Republican majority next year, the I-81 challenge can be funded? Yeah, I think if, if we can get rid of the, these uh, Democrats that are using these fake bills to funnel money to themselves, I think you'll see a lot more happening, not just in Maryland, but across the country. If we get the right people in, we can stop sending 40 billion, I mean, that probably money's already gone down to Ukraine probably and, and wasted on, on uh, things for China. We need to focus on, on America first. Our roads in America, in a lot of places, uh, you drive 78 in, in Pennsylvania and, and you're gonna ruin your car. Just coming here today on, on uh, 70, uh, driving down from Cumberland, they're doing construction, but they've been doing construction for the last 10 years. Nothing's changed. And it's all in the same place. They've been fixing that bridge for five years now, and that same bridge is still broken. Okay? I'm not sure what they're doing with their money, and they pass this infrastructure bill, but by the time it comes down to us, it's too late. Things need to be sped up a little bit. Too I mean, I don't even know what else to say. It <laughs> 
Mariella, the national gas price average hit a new record high at 4.45 a gallon for regular gas last week. And yet, we saw the administration cancel even more oil and gas lease sales Friday. In your opinion, is the U.S. serious about energy independence anymore? Absolutely not. <laughs> I think they're not serious at all. Um, and I do think, and this is one of the things that I talk to my brother all the time. If you didn't know, my brother's a long haul trucker now, and he's seeing it at the pump. His truck is almost $1,000 to fill up. He's telling me that a lot of his colleagues and coworkers are selling their trucks and their businesses because they can't afford it anymore, um, which all of this directly affects everything. It affects, it, it affects the supply chain. Uh, it affects things like uh, baby formula that we're not able to get. And, you know, I really do think that Schroen and Biden and the Democrats really try to claim that the policies that they're trying to push have no effect on gas prices, and that's absolutely wrong. Um, I think what we really need to do to get gas prices back on track is, number one, we've got to reopen the Keystone Pipeline, and we've got to be 100 percent energy independent. <laughs> We've got to stop buying dirty Russian oil, communist Venezuelan oil, and uh, radical Muslim oil. We've got to stop. We've, had to, we've got the resources here, and there's absolutely no reason why we're depending on countries like this. And absolutely, we've, when I get to Congress, I will pass legislation that does not allow any more anti-science destructive lockdowns. I think that really hurt us. It hurt the economy. It hurt, it hurt everything. And I think lockdowns have to never happen again. Thank you. Jonathan, rising electric costs, rising heating fuel costs, rising gasoline are impacting us all. What is the way forward to get us out of this mess? So, um I was in Garrett County a couple weeks ago. A woman was there. She was 84, 85 years old. She was only able to, she had oil heat. She was only able to fill it up halfway. And that's just absolutely insane. That was, a, that was almost like a month ago. So I don't know what the cost was back then. Um, so it, it, it's horrific. They will kill people with this. But kind of look what some other people said. You, you need to uh, bring the prices down by understanding what the problem is. The problem is it's a futures game. And you got to drill, drill, drill on the hope that you're going to find stuff. That's part of it, OK? Um, uh, part of it, however, though, is too, when you drill, you got to be able to allow the, the, these oil companies the freedom that they need. Don't worry about the regulations. Somebody said there's a turtle in the way. How do we know that turtle's in there? And why are we going to stop because of that single turtle? We need to be much smarter on this. We, we need to look at the gas taxes. Why are they so high on that for federal roads? I think we, if we actually could actually do better construction on roads and bridges, kind of like Rob was saying, that could actually bring the cost down too. For example, how come we don't run 24-hour crews? Why are they just eight hours at a time? Why do we have prevailing wage that are going to drive these rates up 30 percent? With the inflation is going to drive everything another 7 percent. So it's it's how we work. It's how we need the money. But it's really come down to these oil companies, allow them the freedom that we needs to get done. Also, I'd like to say Marcellus Shale, right? I was, I'm from Pennsylvania originally. They, no problem in the T of Pennsylvania with the Marcellus Shale, no matter what they say. There is an ability to extract what you need, this natural gas, and guess what? We're sitting on 92 to $93 billion worth right here in Western Maryland, okay? There's a lot there. Now, however, as a congressman, while I want that um, opportunity out there, I still believe it's up to the citizens whether or not they want to have this industry in here to, to extract that. But talk about energy independence and driving costs down, if Maryland can fuel our own through the um, what we, what we have underneath here. So again, it's bad, better construction, allow people to do the business that they want. Don't worry about that turtle. There's other turtles out there. And just, uh, thank you. Matthew, who knew that we would have a baby formula crisis? I began noticing shortages several months ago, and the administration knew of looming shortage late last year. Federal DHS and HHS contracts for food products, including baby formula, give federal contracts a first right where illegal aliens can end up with preferential allocation of baby formula. Do you consider food security a national security issue? And what are your plans to address national food security issues? Americans going hungry at night due to the failed policies of Democrats in Congress is, of course, a national security issue. And 
It's, it, this is because Democrats lock us out of the government that we pay for. Oh, if you had noticed that this baby shortage formula was happening, baby formula shortage was happening, and you went to any of David Trone's offices to tell him about this, he's unreachable. Democrats are causing problems, and now they're hiding from us because they do not want to be held accountable by us, the voters. So it's a short, it's a national security crisis that we don't have baby, baby formula. It's a national security crisis that our energy is not independent. Uh, and the, the Secretary of Energy of the United States of America fears me, and I think that's a badge of honor. She detests me. Why does she detest me? You can look at the, the placards. That's why I was on Tucker Carlson in that screenshot. And it's because as an investigative reporter, I forced her to liquidate her corrupt retirement savings that she was planning on bilking from the taxpayers while, by promoting a company while serving in the administration. We've seen that Democrats in Congress, like David Trone, have their wealth skyrocket while in Congress. Nancy and Paul Pelosi are the best stock traders in the world. Why do you, why do you think that is? Joe Biden's net worth has skyrocketed since he took public office, and that is a serious problem. You should not be going to office to get wealthy. I actually resigned my job as a journalist because I felt that strongly about the need to actually win this seat. David Trone quit on us. We've been giving him paid time off for two and a half years. So it's important that we finally defeat David Trone, and then we can actually solve the problems that these radical Democrats are causing, whether it's a baby food shortage, whether it's every other food shortage that we're facing, whether it's now gas heading to $5 a gallon. These Democrats have no idea about the problems that they're causing because they're completely out of touch. And if you actually want to force any accountability, you'll be greeted by a locked office, you'll be greeted by piles of mail overflowing after I've been calling out David Trone for the past two weeks for his Hagerstown office, having overflowing mailbox, his staff finally cleared it out. But David Trone's Hagerstown office remains closed and locked to the public, which is why we will be there on Thursday informing our voters. But yes, Democrats have created all of these problems. It's time we remove these people from office so we can finally solve them. I would like to talk more about the economy, but we have a lot to cover, so we'll come back if we have time. And let's, a lot of problems. let's move into uh, the discussion on some social issues. Jonathan, we see the left commonly focuses on identity politics and says things are unfair, or how was I offended today? What am I owed? What does unfair actually mean? And can you work across the aisle to accomplish objectives without offending the other side? Great question. I believe this is very simple. When I was a Marine, we were just green. That was it, ugly and green. It's very simple. I don't believe in the identity politics. We need to stop that. They, they keep hammering on that, and that's what's causing children to not understand what's, what's going on here. Um, as, as your congressman, we need to understand all the legislation and the bureaucrats within all the federal agencies that are promoting these, this identity politics. There was something that came out today for a couple days ago about the World Health Organization, how Biden in a couple days wants to actually start seceding health care over to the World Health Organization. Well, if you look in that provision in there, guess what? When they start forming these committees because of some emergency issue around the world, oh, it's got, it's got to have the right equity at the table. It's not the smartest people. It's not the ones that are, make the most sense. Make sure you got the right races in there. Uh, make sure you got the right genders in there. Absolutely insane. That is the most racist stuff you can do. It tears people apart. You know, call me a dumb old Marine, but I think it's simple. We're all Marines or just all Americans. We all just get along. My little guy, Gabriel, my little guy, Gabriel, he's eight years old. I had to tell him that his best friend was a black kid. He didn't even know. This guy, Kanayo, he just hangs out with him every day. He's always at the house. He had no idea. So oh, I thought he was brown. You know, he just, just d doesn't get it. You know, and that's how we got to raise our children. But, and so one of the things, because of my uh, background of artificial intelligence, I want to start using text analytics to identify everything that's published on federal websites, federal publications out there, and start looking for keywords like equity, like diversion, things like that. If we can start identifying these documents, now we can start having forensic um, audits to figure out what these things are for. Let's use technology. So I want to be proposing a whole slew of clean bills just to look at everything that's produced because that has to be eradicated completely out of our government. Thank you. Bob, the Department of Justice and the FBI are reported to have investigated parents for terrorism because they exercised their free speech in opposing critical race theory at school board meetings, also demanding an investigation of a trans person assaulting a female student. Will you work to investigate the FBI and DOJ, and if necessary, support defunding elements of the FBI for these sorts of efforts? <laughs> It's not just the FBI. I think a lot of the government 
uh, agencies like the CIA, the intelligence agencies, the NSA, they are way overstepping their bounds. They're using things like social media, uh, Google, your own computer, your smartphone, and they're spying on you. And they say, oh, we're doing it because of national security. We're, we're, we're trying to find terrorists. But the people they're identifying as terrorists are, are anybody that goes against their ideology or their propaganda. So yeah, if I'm elected, I will do everything in my power to fight against the outreach or the overreach of government agencies and, and hold them more accountable. You know, we've seen, we've seen what they did to General Mike Flynn. We've seen what they did to President Trump and their spying. We see, well, we're seeing now what they're doing to the January 6th uh, issue there. This is all stuff that they've made up and that's how corrupt that they've gotten. They've become so powerful that they just make stuff up just to put their name out there. And calling a parent a terrorist because they're teaching their children that they need to exercise their, their freedom of speech rights, it's just absurd. It's absurd. And they need to be reeled in and they need to be held accountable. Thank you. Mariella. We have recently witnessed mobs threatening conservative Supreme Court justices, protesting outside their homes and consciously seeking to intimidate them into voting as the left demands. And these actions violate the law. How do we protect the integrity of the court when the Biden administration won't? So first what I wanna say is I do think that the leak from the Supreme Court justices was BS, it should have never happened. Um, I really do think that whoever did this should be found and prosecuted to the fur furthest extent. I think it was a disgusting betrayal in our judicial system. And, you know, going back to these social issues and things that are happening, you know, th I, the Biden administration and Trone, they think that, you know, they want to embrace this new woke ideology that says equity is important, but really equity doesn't mean equity for all Americans. It basically just means equity for only those that agree with what they have to say. Um, I do think our law enforcement officials are being treated very badly. My brother was a law enforcement officer before he changed careers and is a truck driver now. And we're seeing things like in Frederick County. I am so proud to live in Frederick County because I really do think that we have one of the best sheriffs, Sheriff Chuck Jenkins. And I've, I've been told to, you know, why don't you move out of Frederick County? And I don't because I truly, genuinely feel safe and it's because of people like Chuck. And we're seeing things there, the, the 28-7G program that only three counties in all of Maryland um, participate in and Frederick is one of them. And Chuck is being attacked by the ACLU because they're calling him a, a racist and it's gotta stop. Our law enforcement officers, uh, fight for us, they protect us, they risk their lives, and I think the culture needs to change. We've gotta get rid of the woke liberals, and people like Merrick Garland have to go. We'll impeach him right after Biden and Mayorkas. We'll, go, we'll get to him, he's third in line. People like these, these leaders have got to go, and we've gotta support our law enforcement, and I will, I will always support our law enforcement. Thank you. Colt, what is your stance on abortion? Well, let's, let's be honest. Uh, abortion is a euphemism, ladies and gentlemen. Abortion is a euphemism for murder. It absolutely is 150% emphatically in murder. There is no other way to put it. Now, at the end of the day, is there certainly some cases for the mother's life that we need to be aware of? Sure. But outside of these circumstances, the reality of it is there is a separate life at stake. And according to the Declaration of Independence, we are afforded these unalienable rights. It does not say it starts when you leave your mother's birth canal. These are unalienable rights that start the minute that you are conceived. We must stand up for life. 
There is absolutely no excuse why we have the abortion numbers we do in this country. I was astounded to learn that in New York City and all the boroughs there, there are more black children aborted than there are born alive. That is absolutely sickening. Our abortion industry is taking advantage of our friends and neighbors in the minority communities throughout the United States. Most of our abortion clinics are within walking distance of minority communities, and we need to stand up and say, enough is enough, and we need to put them out of business. That's what we need to be doing. Thank you very much. Um, Matthew, you, you gave us a great personal story. Uh, leading up to the 2020 election, we witnessed riots, mobs, and political violence from Antifa and other groups that get away with breaking the law and are simultaneously legitimized by the left. What can we do to pressure the FBI and Department of Justice to seriously address this? This is why sending an investigative reporter to Congress is so critical. My colleagues and I were the ones that helped bring down the National School Board Administration for its work directly colluding with the Biden administration to view every single person in this room as a domestic terrorist. Now, I don't think any of us are domestic terrorists, but the Biden administration thinks that if you oppose their policies, you are the enemy. So we need to actually investigate what's going on with the Department of Education colluding with leftist organizations funded by foreign billionaires to investigate parents. Meanwhile, we have a southern border where drugs and criminals are literally pouring across. Fentanyl from China is killing our communities, and the Biden administration sends Kamala Harris to solve this. Does anyone feel safer knowing that Kamala Harris went to the wrong city on the border <laughs> as borders are? No, of course not, because we're a joke. The Biden administration would rather send baby formula to illegal immigrants than to stores here in Washington County. So the administration's priorities are wrong. Remember that this is the administration that's literally giving cell phones to illegal immigrants. So they take none of the actual problems confronting us seriously. They view us and our fellow Americans as domestic terrorists. And we actually need to get to the bottom of how it is possible for the Debar Department of Education to indoctrinate students in critical race theory that I've exposed across the country Quick example, the state of Tennessee is no longer teaching critical race theory in its colleges because of my reporting. I think it's incredibly important that we ban critical race theory in schools across the country because five-year-olds should be taught basic education. They should not be taught that they're racist or that they're stupid because of the color of their skin. And the Biden administration is now is pushing critical gender theory as part of its war on parents. The Biden administration is waging a war on us, a war on parents, rather than a war on the criminals and drugs pouring across our southern border or actual enemies across the world. So look, we need to get to the bottom of this, which is exactly why it's critical to send someone who actually knows how to find the corruption that is endemic in the Biden administration and is ready on day one to work for the people of Maryland to actually get to the bottom of these serious problems that Democrats like David Trone are aiding and abetting. So they got to go. Neil. Contrary to mainstream media reporting, vote fraud and election, ele election irregularity was a real problem. Molly Hemingway's Booked, Rigged, and the movie 2000 Mules are compelling. Our system of government depends on free and fair elections on the local, state, and federal level. If elected, what are your plans in Congress to rebuild election integrity and voter confidence? You know, when you elect somebody to the U.S. Congress, I would think you'd want to elect someone that you can count on, someone that has a record that you can point to and say, you know, when I send this person to Congress, I know where he stands. I know what he's going to do. You don't have to guess my record on election integrity. I've been laughed at by Democrats by putting forward bill year after year after year. I put forward bills to say we need to have voter ID when you go to vote. That needs to happen nationwide. You know. H.R. 1, the Democrat bill this year, said they want to get rid of voter ID in all the states all across the country. It's totally the wrong direction. They're totally trying to allow cheating. I don't even understand how they could justify that. In the General Assembly, I introduced a bill that said if you're going to register to vote, we need to make sure that you're a U.S. citizen when you register to vote right then. Yeah. We have the capability to do it. Just go get your driver's license. We all know. Do you have your papers or not? Uh, it'd be very easy. But you know, when you go to get your driver's license, if you're an illegal alien in Maryland, 
They'll let you have a license, but it won't be the same one that you and I get. It'll be a special license because they know that this is an illegal alien. But they still say, would you like to vote? It's unbelievable. That's what happens right now at the MVA in Maryland because that's the direction they're taking. That's got to stop, and I put a legislation that we need to stop that. I also put in just this year legislation that says when you vote by mail and you request that vote by mail, we need to verify that signature. Is it really that person or not? It's really easy to do. Banks do it all the time. They have computer programs that can flag it to say, is this really the person or not? Of course, it didn't pass, but those types of things need to happen nationwide so we can have voter integrity. And you have my record that I've done this already in the Maryland General Assembly. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Jonathan, the First Amendment to the Constitution begins, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Yet today, many Americans believe the free exercise of religion is being attacked culturally, politically, and by the government. If you agree, what do you think Congress can do to protect constitutional rights such as the freedom of religion? So for the most part, government needs to stay out of all religious bodies. And uh, so separated church and state was not about government coming into your religious bodies. It was that you had some sort of faith coming into government. Right? So we need to really just look at the people that are attacking us. That's the issue. We have half this country now believes they are atheist or agnostic. We have a serious problem here to maintain our culture. We need to focus on those internal things. We need to figure out why families are falling apart from that. This is not going to be solved by a government issue. All government, I believe, their role should be is making sure it's a, it's a, a fair um, field, if you will. We see that we're being flagged quite a bit for being terrorists, right? There's a lot of people attacking Jewish groups, for example. A lot of shootings are, are there. How do we start using technology to identify why people cannot speak about their issues? How do, we, how do we use technology so that people can get their issues out there and spread the word? We know that there's a lot of censorship going on. If you're a Christian or a Jew, right, you put something in there, you may not see it online. It is amazing. So we got to go after these social media companies as much as possible and at least tell, if they want to do that, that's fine, but at least they should describe what are their algorithms, how are they doing it, and why are they discriminating? If they just want to deal with certain people, okay, we just won't use those platforms. But for the most part, I really don't think we can legislate government to clean this up. This is um, a personal issue, a family issue, your, your body of faith as much as possible. Government should just make sure that nobody's censoring you as much as possible. I had so many more questions I wanted to ask you all, um, but it is time to move into closing statements. The order was drawn backstage and each candidate will have two minutes to leave us with their final thoughts. First, Jonathan Jenkins. All right, first, thank you very much. Really appreciate it being here. Um, I hate being behind a podium. I'm usually the guy that's running all over the place. I don't like being low energy here, but I'll do it. I am the candidate that's the grassroots guy. I am out there. Before the map was even declared, I did not care. I was running because I got two little kids and I'm not dealing with it. I did not go 6,000 miles to come home and all of a sudden, right here in my backyard, everything's being weathered away, being destroyed by George Soros and the like of his ilk, right? So that's why I am out there every single day. My worst days is probably three hours. When I take the trips up to Garrett County, Allegheny County, I'm up there for two days, usually 15, 16 hours a day. As you see the videos I have online, I am the hustler. I have been there. I have, I have knocked on more doors than everyone else up here. I have made more phone calls than everyone else, okay? I have gone to more group meetings than everyone else up here. It's not a slight on them. It's just how I hustle every single day. Just like in the Marines, you've got to hustle every single day like you're at war here. So if you want the candidate that can win, it is me. Just because the map changed doesn't mean you can't hustle. It may be a plus one to the Republicans, but you still need a guy like me that's going to hustle at this right after the primary, 16 hours a day, going and getting it, not trusting somebody's knowledge that, oh, you got this in a bag. No, I have been to most townships. I have been to most of the, the businesses in, the, uh, in Western Maryland, and I will continue to work that as much as possible. I ask you to please join me. I am I'm the candidate with the most wisdom. I have the most energy going at it. I've already demonstrated um, great examples. Allegheny GOP Club gave me a pre-primary endorsement, okay? 
How about that, pre-primary, because I keep showing up. I keep showing up. Garrett County, the way tells me not to show up all the time sometimes, right? That's me, so I'd really appreciate your vote. I promise if you um, elect me, I'm gonna be there all the time. There will be at least one public town hall every single month, every single county. You will know me, I will be present, and I'm here for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Second, Matthew Foldy. I loved my job as an investigative reporter, blowing the lid on the biggest corruption stories of the Biden administration. In fact, I would say I was probably the Biden administration's least favorite reporter. And soon, I'll be their least favorite congressman. If Beth needs a new job, I think she's actually a better reporter than most of the journalists in the, in the mainstream media. But I resigned my job because David Trone quit on us. David Trone does not care about us. David Trone does not live in this district. David Trone does not vote in this district. David Trone does not even vote in Washington. He skipped 25% of the votes despite living in Potomac. This gives Nancy Pelosi a check to destroy our country through Bidenflation. This gives Democrats a blank check to defund the police. This gives Democrats a blank check to let China infiltrate our government. This gives Democrats a blank check to give Iran nuclear weapons and everything else we know. David Trone's offices are closed for business. If David Trone ran Total Wine, the way he runs his government offices that we pay for, he'd have been fired a very, very long time ago. And that's exactly what we're going to do this November when we finally fire David Trone and Nancy Pelosi. Look, I'm running for Congress because we need a new generation of leadership to stop Joe Biden, Nancy Pelosi, and Kamala Harris from destroying our country. The current leadership in Washington is clearly not going to get it done, and I'm not going to sit around and wait while Democrats destroy the country for people in my generation and destroy the country for people like my grandma who live on fixed income that, ma that matters less and less and less as Bidenflation cripples every American in this country. I'm running for Congress to save our future, expose and investigate this corrupt administration and make representing the people here in this room and even David Trone if he ever moves to this district my full-time job. My name is Matthew Foldy. Thank you so much for being here tonight, and thanks to my parents and my friends from Allegheny to Montgomery County who came here tonight. Look forward to talking with you all this evening. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Next, Bob. One of the greatest things that I learned when I was in law enforcement is the ability to sacrifice. I sacrificed my time. I sacrificed my family. There were times that uh, I would get home at 5 o'clock. Being a criminal investigator, something would happen. I get that call 35 minutes into just being home, started cooking dinner, and I have to go back to work. I'm not afraid to work. But I know this. I know that David Trone needs to leave my district. I live in Allegheny County. I've lived there for 20-something years. David Trone has been in office now, I think, two or three terms, and I have never seen him. From the start of my campaign, I made it very clear that you need to do your research because you need to make 2022 count. I raised four kids by myself. I retired from the federal government and I still have to work a full-time job. Is that person gonna be me? I think you need to do your research. I'm sacrificing myself tonight my own desire to run. And I'm gonna put this out there. From my campaign, Poison Air for Congress, I endorse Jonathan Jenkins. Thank you. Now, Neil Parrott. You know, this position is very important. We have to win. And you have to have someone that you can count on. It's too important to take a risk on someone who you don't know their voting record, you don't know what they're actually gonna do if they ever get to Congress, they're an unknown. I have a proven record 
I have a proven winning record running three races. I have proven experience. People matter. And right now, American families, they're hurting. We've got high inflation, struggling businesses, and battles over what children are taught in our own schools. They don't have control of their children's education. During my 12 years in the Maryland General Assembly, I have a record of working for families, for faith, for freedom. You don't know how, you don't have to guess how I'm gonna vote when I go to Congress. We need to beat David Trone this coming November. We have to replace Nancy Speaker, <laughs> Nancy Pelosi as Speaker of the House. You can count on me to get that job done. We're gonna be one of the five seats right here that flips from Democrat to Republican, remove Nancy Pelosi. But you know, one other thing I wanna talk about, it's not just about policy, it's about treating people well. As a delegate, I don't just have a conservative record, but I have a record of helping people when they have problems. You know, there's the Brownsville Pond, they drained it. We got it filled back up. Now the fire engines, the people in Boonesboro, they have a place where they can go to actually put out fires. You know, the black flies, especially Southern Washington County, they were destroying people's lives. People couldn't even move there. There were swarms of them. We're treating the black flies. Actually gonna start a little bit later this month, so it's great news. Boonesboro, they had a traffic issue. Within an hour, I had that straightened out. They striped it wrong. It was completely wrong. It was going to cause a crash. One of their council members called me right away. Bam, I knew who to call at the State Highway Administration. We got it changed. That's what you can count on for me. Not just policy, but you can't count on policy. But you can also know that I will be there for you each and every day. And I thank you for being here tonight. I thank you for listening if you're on TV. And I ask you to go to neilparrot.org where you can learn more about my campaign and you can sign up to support me. NeilParrot.org, thank you. Thank you, Neil. Mariella Roca is next. Thank you. Um, this was a great opportunity, and I am so glad that every single one of you came out here to learn a little bit about us. And, but I, what I really want to do say is we cannot forget how big of a fight this is going to be. Um, I think there's five candidates now running for office, um, but this is going to be one of the most hotly contested swing districts in the country. David Trone and the Democrats are going to pour so much money into this campaign and they're going to come after us and you're going to need someone that the Democrats are going to fear. I can say that I'm the only person here that is going to be able to bring in some of the minority votes, some of the Hispanic votes, so a lot of these people that are coming to the Republican Party and we have to make sure that we can properly speak to them and show them what a true conservative and what our true conservative values are. I've been to war. I've looked the Taliban in the eye, like I said, and I think I can handle David Trone, the lying media, and the suit boys in Capitol Hill. So I would be so humbled and honored to have your vote. Please go to rocaforcongress.com, learn more about me, and elect a fighter like me to represent you in Congress. Thank you. Thank you. And to close, Colt Black. So we've heard a lot of good commentary this evening, and I want to thank everybody for being here. The reality of it is, ladies and gentlemen, is we hear a lot of talk about what folks will do when they get to Washington, D.C., what controls they'll put in place. And the reality of it is, is controls are merely that, controls. At the end of the day, we need to look to the Constitution for true and honest guidance. Out of everybody here on this stage this evening, I have put myself out as a true constitutional conservative. The reality of it is if the federal government's uh, jobs, their, their agencies, does not fall within Article I, Section 8 of the United States Constitution, they absolutely must be abolished and eliminated. We cannot continue. We cannot continue to fund agencies that are duplicates at the state and local level. We must continue to work diligently to ensure that our constitutional rights are 150 percent respected across the board by both local, state, and federal law enforcement, not hauling parents out of Board of Education meetings for speaking out under their First Amendment freedoms. And we must ensure that our Second Amendment rights are absolutely upheld and protected throughout the United States. 
We have to work together and come together and realize that Democrat or Republican, it doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, government cannot do God's work. And we need to work diligently to get government the hell out of the way of the American people and get ourselves back to true individual freedoms. Thank you very much. I'm Colt Black for Congress. Please feel free to visit our website, coldblackforcongress.com. Can we have a big round of applause for every candidate? We want to thank Antietam Broadband for broadcasting tonight's event, Hagerstown Community College, BT Design Group, the team at CopyQuick, and all our volunteers tonight. To each candidate I share the stage with and all who joined beforehand, your willingness to lead is appreciated and I wish you all the best as the primary approaches on July 19. Though I do favor Derek Harvey for county commissioner. <laughs> and I think I can say that because you get to vote for five, so free speech. The freedom we have to gather together tonight is thanks to the Almighty and many brave men and women who have come before us fighting to found America the beautiful. May we continue to protect and preserve the documents that unite our 50 great states. Sharon Gish, whose name you will see on the ballot for Republican Central Committee, will close us in prayer. Thank you. Father, we thank you so much for everyone that was able to come out tonight and for all the people who will see this on TV. We pray that you protect, guide, and take care of all of the candidates that we have who have bravely stepped up and said, pick me. We're thankful for them, Lord. We're thankful for all of the people that have stepped up and run. We're humbled at the amount of outpouring of people who have stepped up to run. And we thank you. Please guide us as we go home from here. Keep us safe and in our journeys. Continue to keep us safe in your son's name. Amen. That's a wrap. <laughs>